Hey guys, so this is the second part of the evaluation board based on the RP2040 series. And in this video, I'm going to go over the actual design of the PCB layout. But before I get into that, I wanna go over a couple things on the schematic that are a little bit different from how it was in the first video, and then just clear up a couple things that came up in the comments. Okay, so the biggest thing is just kind of the general format. Since I was doing the last one on the fly, I couldn't really make everything super clean. So I cleaned everything up. Then in the 2040 block, since I failed multiple times with the decoupling caps, I fixed all of them. So now it actually is set up where there's no dead shorts or anything. And then, whoops. And then on the connector, I adjusted the pinout of where the 5 volt 3v3 and ground were and I think this stayed the same and then something I noticed uh, on the RGB is I have the G so the green pin going to red red going to green and then the blue is correct so that's just going to be something in firmware when we go to test it just to keep in mind obviously electrically it doesn't matter because these labels are just names and then something that came up a lot in the comments was there were a lot of people or I guess a few people who were very opinionated on why I used a set of MOSFETs to drive the LEDs when I should have just sunk the current directly with the microcontroller. And I mean, yes, sure, you could have. Uh, it's honestly, it's industry standard to do it this way. You rarely will see on like a industrial, even consumer board where they do drive pretty much any type of current source or sync device from a microcontroller. The exception is if it's a super low bomb count board, a super cheap board, because obviously the MOSFETs do cost money, but we're talking pennies, tens of cents maybe. And if you wanted to get cheaper, you could use a transistor. And then we're talking about a couple pennies. The reason why is just you don't really want to have anything with a microcontroller driving anything that draws any significant amount of current even though these are limited to a few milliamps each it still takes away from the total current that the rest of the microcontroller can source or sync and since this is evaluate an evaluation board every milliamp that you're drawing from the leds is one less milliamp you can use on the rest of the pins and it's just nice to be driving into a super high impedance gate so you know that it's going to be a lot more protected from anything else on here. But again, whatever whatever floats your boat, if you really don't wanna use an extra three parts, by all means do it. Just keep in mind and calculate how much current that's going to draw and subtract it from the total allocation of the rest of the board. Now, before I get into the actual start of the layout, I'm going to start from the finished board and go over something that I don't know if I've done in the past, go over the design rules that I use, and then also touch on the stack up that I'm using. So for the design rules, and this is kind of the bog standard that I will start with on a four layer board. So basically for the standard design rules, I'm using metric. So 0 0.15 millimeters, which is six mil. Pretty much any PCB fabricator nowadays, that's standard, so you won't be charged and upcharged for it. The rest stays pretty much the same. Copper to edge clearance depends on the fab. I usually keep the zero and then adjust it on the panelization side, but you can do a quarter millimeter, you can do a half millimeter. Uh, if you have space, you can go bigger. It really, really doesn't matter too much. Through hole, hold hole clearance, this all pretty much stays the same. For the predefined sizes, I usually just throw in a handful that I can switch to while routing. You don't have to, it just makes it a little bit easier. And then standard via size, I start with 0 0.3 and 0 0.65. If this ends up being too big, the next one I will go with is 0 0.25 and 0 0.55. Most fabs will upcharge you for going to a 0 0.25 millimeter hole, and sometimes it's pretty significant. So I try to stay at 0 0.3 if possible. And then the only other thing that I will change is on the solder mask and paste, I do the absolute clearance of negative 0 .0, negative 0 0.05 millimeters. And what this does is if you look at the paste here, it basically shrinks in the paste from the solder mask, which the solder mask is purple, which is the same size as the copper. 
and this helps gasket the stencil a little bit better and it also gives you a little bit more wiggle room the one thing to watch out for is depending on how much you do shrink that it can make some of your pads a little bit too narrow to where this the paste isn't going to release which that maybe i cover in the supplemental video or i'll do a separate video on because i think it's a little outside of the scope of this so that's kind of the initial design rules. And then the stack up that I'm using is super simple. It's kind of a more modern approach. Uh, Rick Hartley is the main person, the main designer who has kind of made it popular. And instead of doing the top layer as power, or sorry, the top layer as signal, bottom as signal, and then power, and then ground on the two inner layers, which was traditionally done, what this new stack up is, is top is power in signal, bottom is power in signal, and then the inner two layers are ground. And it makes it harder to route because you don't have a dedicated power pour. But what's super nice about it is you have two dedicated return path pours. So as long as you can handle the power routing, which I'll cover when I go over the layout, it really makes it easy because you never have to worry about crossing anything in the pour, never have to worry about crossing a split because your two inner layers are 100% ground, which makes it really easy. So it might be a little bit more of a pain in figuring out how to route your power, but I think the benefits of it greatly outweigh any of the negatives, which the negative really is it just takes a little bit longer to route. So that's pretty much what I'll do on virtually every layout we do nowadays, and it's what I'm going to do on here. So with all of that said, we're ready to jump into doing the layout. So for the rest of the layout or the rest of the video, I'm gonna go through it in a different way to where I'm able to, instead of just doing a time lapse, I can kind of go back and forth throughout the doing the layout. And I think this is gonna make a lot more sense than me just speeding it up like normal. So the first thing I do on a board like this to where, like I said, everything is central and along that axis, I put both of the connectors on that vertical axis. Then I roughed in where the pin headers would be. And this isn't to an actual grid yet. This is just to kind of get the layout kind of roughed in. Then I place the microcontroller dead center because it needs to be dead center with respect to where the connectors are. And then I tried starting to work with the oscillator, but it didn't really make, or the flash memory, but that didn't really make sense. So what I do instead here, and this is pretty common with most of my layouts, is I just kind of group all like parts together. If this was a hierarchical sheet or more based on a hierarchical sheet, it would have had all of the parts a lot closer together and it would make this part a little bit easier. But either way, I'm just kind of going back and forth on the schematic to the PCB, grabbing all capacitors, all resistors, everything in their own grouping. And this just makes it so much easier when you go to route it instead of just kind of picking and choosing where everything is. So for the next five, 10 minutes, I just go through, grab every single part and lump them as close as possible to where they belong on the layout. So now with everything kind of roughed in, so you can see the microcontroller block, the flash block, the buttons, the oscillator, the pat or the pull-ups for the I2C, all of the USB, and then just some random like LED and then peripherals over here. I can kind of go and start wherever I want since USB is the highest speed interface. That's just where I decided to. You easily could have started with the microcontroller end also and it really wouldn't have made a difference. And here's kind of where you're starting to see some of the USB-C stuff. Had it have been a two layer board, you really wouldn't want to use that bottom layer for a lot. And the USB side is kind of tough to run just on the two layers. It also makes having controlled impedance a little bit more difficult. Again, you certainly could do this on two layers, but this is just one point where it kind of made a little bit more sense to have it before. So I'm just putting the USB or the ESD diode as close as possible to the connector because if there's an ESD event on this connector, I don't want it to be on the board for any distance longer than absolutely mandatory. So that's why you wanna put this as close as possible to the connector, not just randomly on the board. 
and then routing the series resistors, I adjusted them here to where they're closer in line with how the differential pair will be routed. And based on the stack up information, it came out to be a spacing of 0 0.2 millimeters and a width of 0 0.15. And actually that's wrong. It should be 0 0.25, 0 0.15. And this just depends on whatever fab you're using. For USB, I'll never have the fab actually control it. I just do my best that I can with the calculator and it almost, or not almost, it always works. USB, even if it's, especially if it's USB 2.0, it really doesn't matter. Even if it's faster, it still normally doesn't matter. Now here, just doing the CC pins, which they are just, pull downs so they really don't matter where they're run but again using that bottom pour for this which if it was a two layer board would be a bit of a pain and then here I'm just kind of roughing in the power side and as I've mentioned a lot in the past when I start doing layouts with the exception of here for the differential pair I tend to almost always just start with a thin trace to get everything roughed in then at the end, I'll start to beef up the traces, especially on the power or for any section that actually matters, just because I don't want to start cleaning everything up before the actual route is finished. You end up kind of doing the work twice or three times. So now from here, I know that I need to get the five volt power rail outside of the connector. And the easiest way, at least that I saw, was just to drop a via in between the connector and then run again a pretty thin trace. I do beef this one up a tiny bit just to bump it out there. And then I go ahead and connect the other side of the five volt to this. Also, you really didn't have to, but just because it'll help lower the impedance, lower the resistance, you might as well. And then from here, it goes over to the big input capacitor. And then I decide to drop it down to the three V three right at the entrance. Just because I know I'm going to shrink down the height of the board, I figured I wanted to get the 3v3 rail as quick as possible because other than the LED, the 5 volt isn't used for anything else. So it didn't make sense to run that 5 volt any longer distance. Of course, if you care about voltage drop and you're doing something else, it maybe makes sense to keep the higher voltage longer, but I didn't really care. Now I'm throwing a pour on all four layers and the clearance I start with is 0 0.2, 0 0.2. And then I throw reliefs on for the plated through holes with just the default 0 0.508 millimeter gap and spoke width. And I draw that along the entire side. And I do that early a lot of times just because it makes it so there's not as many rat's nest lines for the ground. You don't have to, and I've mentioned in the past that a lot of people don't. I'll show you a little later what I do to kind of ensure that all my connections are good, but I just find it kind of cleans things up a little bit. So now with the five volt, I just start routing it to a few of the parts that need five volt over here, which like I said, is the LED input and then the resistors that go to each of them. And even though LED, the LED is obviously not a high priority, I start with it here. Again, I've said this a couple of times just because it takes five volts. So once I do that, now nothing else on the board needs five volts. And all I have to worry about is the 3v3, which makes it, at least in my mind, a little bit easier, only worrying about that one power rail. So I get the five volt over there and now I grab the MOSFETs that are needed to, or not needed, like I said at the beginning of the video that I am using to switch on the RGB channels of the RGB LED. And I'm just throwing these in a arrangement that makes sense based on how they're going to run up to the microcontroller. And then the series resistors are thrown right there to help limit the current and the rise time to the gate. And then I run the bottom FET on the bottom layer just to help get it up even with where the other inputs are. And then from here, everything on the bottom side or the south side of the board is pretty much done. And this is why I like doing it in sections just because now everything down here is connected and you see the one rat's nest for 3v3, the two sets of rat's nest for the USB differential pair the three sets of lines for the gates to the LED MOSFETs, 
And then one last wire, I did lie, there is a five volt connection to the evaluation board pin header. But other than that, everything down here is connected and it just makes it super clean to kind of start with block by block. So now next, since I did the USB and everything on the south side, the obvious place to start now is to work on the microcontroller. And here, usually the highest priority part is if you're using a crystal, since this is using an oscillator, like I said in the first video, it makes it a lot easier to handle. I just still kind of started with it, but it's not near as high a priority because you only have to worry really about this single trace, which makes it a lot easier. And then when placing the decoupling capacitors, I also mentioned this in the last video, it's a super weird part in that the ground pins are all under the part in the thermal pad. So you don't have the ability to have like a 3v3 ground pair to tie each resistor, or each capacitor to. So what I just do, and I'm sure there's a bunch of different ways you could have done this, is I just orientated all the capacitors like this instead of at a 90 degree angle like you normally would, even though that does make it a bigger loop going under. With 0603s, I really didn't have a choice because I'm using almost every single pin. Had it have been 90 degrees over, I literally would have ran out of space to have everything. Since we're using an exorbitant amount of decoupling caps as is, I don't think it's gonna be an issue and I think it works out pretty well. And something you'll see me do, and I'm not going to get into a ton of the reasoning behind this, but you want to have your vias for decoupling caps as close as possible to the center of the capacitor, and it just decreases the size of the loop. On some of these, you'll see I had to drag it out to here to, again, have space. So it's not absolutely required, but everything with decoupling and filtering, you want to decrease the size of the loop. So that's why I'll start with stuff like this, and it's why if you're using VN pads, it makes such a big difference to lower that impedance because you're lowering that loop area. So I just go through here and place all of the decoupling caps for the 3v3 rail and the 1v1 rail just like this. Same with the grounds, trying to tuck them in as tight as possible. There's really no science here. You just do the best you can. And something just a little nuance. You see how I connect these up away from the pin? You never wanna connect them across here. There's a couple reasons. One, it violates the IPC standard, but the second reason and the reason why it violates it is if there's no solder mask placed, or even if there is, it's going to make the solder want to wick across here, which I know you're thinking, oh, well, they're connected. It doesn't matter. That's true. But the issue is if you're inspecting this board and you don't know that it's supposed to be connected, you're going to think it's a short and you're going to spend time reworking this board even though it's correct. So just get into the habit of never bridging connections like this. And you also have to care about that if you have a ground pour, it'll automatically connect it there. So what I sometimes will do is do a little keep out rectangle just to block it. Again, it doesn't affect electrically, but something to get in a good habit of making sure it does. So all of the capacitors, all the decoupling caps are done. And now the next thing is to do the pull-up resistor and capacitor for the reset line. So once that is done, everything with the core functionality of the microcontroller is done. We still need to get the tag connect, how to program it, and then get the flash memory set up. But again, I like to do one singular block at a time just to help keep everything nice and compact and in sync. So now going with the flash memory, like I said, with the schematic, we have a series resistor for all of the data lines and all the clock lines. Since the data lines are bi-directional, you ideally want to have them at about halfway between the microcontroller and the flash chip. On such a short run, it absolutely does not matter, but it's just something I kind of wanted to highlight here. And also you, in theory, would like to have all of the trace lengths be roughly the same length, but on something this low speed, it definitely doesn't matter. Just again, something to kind of get in the habit of. So here, it was actually kind of a pain figuring out how to route these, having to use every single pin so here I'm just kind of moving and nudging things around to get it to where it all does line up. Again, doing a layout is more of 
just randomly guessing until something works rather than having an exact like I need to do this 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 it's just kind of like art you just have to kind of mess with it and see what happens so once that is sorted and reconnecting this, we now have the flash chip connected. And that is one more thing that is central to the microcontroller that we have finished up. So next thing I do is I connect those last couple traces that I needed to and then add the decoupling cap to the flash chip. And then there's also the pull up and then the series resistor for the chip select that I drag in. And now that flash chip is now completely done. And from here, because now it's kind of about time to get the sizing of everything correct and how narrow this board should be before we start routing the traces from the microcontroller to the pin headers, I want to throw the pin headers on the 2.54 millimeter grid and then bring them in. And then in order to do this a little more accurately too, is I move everything over to center it on the zero line of the or the origin of the board layout so that's what i'm doing here just dragging everything to zero zero or at least zero in the vertical and then moving all of the pin headers as tight in as possible so now from here it's literally just a act of getting the tag connect connector in place and then routing every single trace for the pin headers and like i said a minute ago there's really no skill here it's just nudging things around until you have enough space because like here i didn't have room to bump these out so i just move the decoupling caps over i move the resistors over just enough to where i can just barely squeak those traces out and then route them to the tag connect dropping it to the bottom layer where i have to and then going over to the pin headers and now once those are done, it's pretty easy on the rest of them, just nudging the decoupling caps where I need to. And then this is one of the examples to where I needed to move the ground out to the more in line with the cap, with the capacitor. And like I said, yes, it makes it perform a little bit worse, but we have plenty of decoupling caps to where I'm not worried. And then something that honestly ends up taking the longest time with any layout is just making it look pretty. So trying to get the spacing of all of these traces accurate, it absolutely doesn't affect how the board will perform, but you want to make sure it looks good. And that, like I said, can take a ton of time doing. So try not to get too, too hung up with it, but do try to make the board look fairly decent. So here, just continuing running the last few traces on the west header and then dragging everything over to make it look again nice and clean. And for the east header, it is exactly the same thing, except maybe even a little bit easier because we didn't have to worry about that tag connect. And again, moving the decoupling cap via to be in line with the other via to make sure that we have enough spacing. And then here, again, the OCD is making sure that all the traces line up. And once we have the rest of these traces run, and now, so like this is what I mean. Like this looks super not in sync and not lined up. So here I spend a little bit just dragging everything on the correct grid to make it to where they're all even spaced. And of course, if these were higher speed lines, you would take special care to make sure you're actually spacing them far enough for whatever speed the signal is. But for this, it of course does not matter. So this is purely aesthetics. And now once that's done, I want to continue to making this as small as possible. So making sure I select the ground point and use that as the origin, I drag everything down to where the USB connector is making sure I do have enough space there. And then from here, I decide that what makes the most sense is of course to run the USB differential pair since that's the highest priority. And now that the distance between the microcontroller and the USB connector is fixed, I think it makes sense to run them now. And for the differential pair, they were crisscrossed. So I needed to make sure I swapped the orientation of them when I ran the trace down. And the differential pair router in KiCad on the latest version isn't very good. I don't know. It happened when they switched from 5 to 6. It's like a pain in the butt to get, especially on different layers, to connect to the vias. So what I'm doing here is not 
actually anything useful. I'm just trying to battle with the differential router to make it work. And a lot of times you have to kind of manually connect them at one point or another. And that's what I did there is I just had to move from the top layer to the bottom closer to make it at an easier point for them to connect. So there's the differential pair ran. So now other than power and then a couple just touch up traces here and there and then the I2C connector, the layout is pretty much done. And since power is, of course, the most important thing to do next, that's what I figure I do. But before I do that, just to knock out the last couple signal traces, I take the RGB for the RGB LED and I route those real fast to connect that. So now from here, it's pretty much just the power, which is nice when it has everything else routed. Sometimes I'll do the power at the beginning, but normally it's I'll partially do the power kind of like I did here, just because it kind of makes sense a lot of times to have all the signal traces ran first. So here I'm just kind of messing around with seeing what makes the most sense with where it should go. So here I do the five volt line at the start to get that taken care of. And again, using pretty thin traces that I'll beef up later. So now I take the 3v3 from the left side and run it up along to the left side of the board or the west side. And then I also come across on the east side and run power over to the pin header. And now this is the big part where doing the RP2040 on a two layer board is kind of a pain because you have the 1v1 rail that has to cut across the entire internal of the part and the 3v3, you really would have to make a lot of sacrifices. And I've certainly seen it done. You totally can. But honestly, to have it a decent layout, I'd probably always do a four layer board with the 2040. So what I do here is I take 3v3, kind of like how I took it from the USB-C connector, I take it from the left side and then I also take it from the right side and even connect them together, which kind of makes it like a pour. Again, the more and thicker the trace or pour you have, the lower the impedance and the lower the resistance is. And it's also going to help avoid ground loops because you're not drawing from a single point at multiple distances, causing there to be a voltage drop. This of course could just be a power pour which maybe would even make more sense, but to just kind of visualize where the actual power is coming from, I figured I would just keep it as traces for now. So from here, I need to start routing the actual power connections on the microcontroller, and that includes the 1v1 connections and the 3v3. And this is another example of just where there's really no rhyme or reason. A lot of times when you start doing a layout because you don't know how it's going to turn out right at the start, so I needed to move the differential pair vias for the USB up a little bit to be able to clear and get space to have the traces go through it. So I moved that a little bit and now it's really just kind of nudging the decoupling caps, nudging my 1v1 traces and connecting all the vias across there. And again, using pretty small traces. These, I don't know if you really would need to even beef them up simply because they're just going to an individual trace on the microcontroller and it's not like it's carrying a lot of current or anything. It goes to the individual pin anyway, which is going to be skinny. So just dropping a via to have the bottom pore or the bottom trace to be able to pop up to the top trace and the decoupling caps. Yes, you probably shouldn't have it go through the via first because that's going to add a little bit of impedance but considering that the ground pins for the microcontroller are in the center anyway, and by default have to go in a via, you really don't have much of a choice. And now just tying the rest of the 3v3 pins to that bottom trace as well. Nothing really too special with any of this. And then, like I said, with the ground pour, we have to have a way to get the ground that is out here from the decoupling caps into this. And you could do that with thermal vias or a thermal defined pad to have vias in here. You could do it with via in pad, which would obviously be pretty expensive. Or what you can also do is just sprinkle some ground vias throughout it. And that's what I went with here. 
having thermal defined vias would certainly be an improvement and probably should do it but i just didn't bother on this layout right here because as long as you can sprinkle them around enough that should be okay but again this is one of the i think issues or disadvantages with raspberry pi how they designed this without any ground pins out here i get why they did it it made it so it was a smaller footprint and it didn't have to have as many pins but you are going to have that sacrifice to where everything has to go through that via and now they're just connected i forgot the 3v3 for the oscillator for the led down there and then or yeah it was the oscillator sorry and now the last couple things to place are just the switch for the to set it into the USB. I think it's the USB DFU mode. If you pull or push the button, it drops the chip select pin for the SPI flash low. And that enables it when you do it, I think, on power up. It drops it into that DFU mode, which lets you flash the firmware directly using the USB port, which is pretty cool. And then the reset button is just like any other reset button. It pulls the reset pin low, so you can drop it into a power on reset. And now I am routing, kind of similar to how I did the USB, routing the I2C for the ESD diode. And much in the same way, you want to have it as close as possible to that connector and have the ground via also as close to the connector so if there is a surge it's going to be the, s the shortest loop and it's going to go as short of a distance onto the board as possible because the longer that route is the more issues and more potential damage it can cause so now from this point it's just shrinking down the pcb a little bit dragging in the pores and then that is essentially the bulk of the layout finished so now to wrap up the video, I'm going to go over the final board that I actually ordered since obviously the one I did super quick on the video, it's kind of hard to do all the fine details. So I just want to kind of cover some changes that I made and what the final layout looks like. So the biggest thing is just kind of cleaning things up to make everything a little more orderly and again to look better. Added the logo, of course, added mounting holes for the Kai Kit panelization. I added the annotated tabs, which if you don't know about Kai Kit, make sure you check out the video that I did, uh, I think a couple weeks ago, four weeks ago, which covers Kai Kit and how to make panels that way. It's pretty fantastic. I beefed up all the 3v3, a lot of the power traces, even in here. And on something that's kind of funny that I didn't realize until just going over this now, the trace width and spacing for the differential pairs on here is not correct. So the impedance for the USB was not what it should have been. And I've tested this board and programmed it and done communications. Everything with it works perfect. So I'm kind of glad I did that just because it shows what I kind of talk about all the time that for slower speed USB, it really doesn't matter especially and this isn't even a particularly short trace and it still worked out fine so obviously you should still not do that and it should still be as close as possible but just wanted to point that out because it was kind of interesting to me so yeah this is the layout of the board i hope you guys liked this format of video and doing the layout this way instead of just the time lapse it's way quicker for me to edit and film so hopefully you guys like it and with, oh, one other thing that I wanted to mention. So something that I like doing, which I think helps immensely when you're making sure your connections are valid or good on your ground pores. So what I will do is I will delete the pore that's on the top layer. So I got rid of the ground on the top layer and then I'll run a DRC check and I've got a few unconnected items uh, for the USB just because I connected them all together in the schematic so we can ignore that. These are silk screens over the edge and then for whatever reason there's a co-located hole on the vias which we don't or the uh, mounting holes which we don't have to worry about. But what this does is basically let's say one of my decoupling caps here I forgot to put a via. Now it's an unconnected trace because there's no top pore. So if we run our DRC, it's going to show an error right here. And this is really important because if we have our top pore like this, 
it's not going to show an error because it is connected to ground. But this essentially is now completely useless because this ground route has to go all the way through here, all the way to here to ground before it can do anything, which obviously it's not serving any purpose for decoupling. So get in the habit of, if you're using a top ground pour, go ahead and just delete it at the, at the end of the video, the end of the video, at the end of your layout, refill your pour and see if it's connected or not. And that's something to really get in the habit of. In this, I also didn't have any stitching vias. You probably should, it's not going to hurt you. But due to the fact of making sure that everything is connected to a via, you ultimately don't really have to because every ground connection is going to be connected directly at its point. And of course, I know you're thinking, oh, but wherever it crosses over, the return currents need to get back around it. And yes, that's true. But on a good four layer board where you've got an adjacent ground port, it's really not a huge issue. But yes, you probably should have stitching vias. And when I go to order more of these, I will probably add stitching vias as well as doing the differential pairs, the correct width and spacing. But again, it shows even with some of these issues, it still works fine. You just have to know when it really does matter and when it doesn't. And honestly, that just kind of comes with experience and testing and failing quite a bit. But yeah, so that now wraps this video up. So again, let me know in the comments what you think of this format, what you think of the project as a whole. And the next video will be me assembling and testing and potentially a little bit of EMC stuff on it. I don't know if there's going to be time, but we'll see. So I will see you guys in the next video. Have a good one.